Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared and oh boy, have I been working on something for the last couple days. Um, this wasn't supposed to be that complicated, <laughs> but I ended up making a new spreadsheet. Um, by the time this is all said and done, whenever the end of my YouTube channel comes, I'm going to have like a million spreadsheets, but it's okay because that's how you keep track of information. That's how you keep everything straight. It, there's a lot of stuff to remember and you can't do it unless you write it down. And for me, it's spreadsheets because you can you can e easily organize things and analyze different sets of data. And uh, I've put together a new set. So th this is how it happened. Um, I have this playlist that I'm working on called Social Media Posts where I'm going year by year through, uh, I guess the idea is to go through everybody's social media posts, like all the 15. I don't know if we'll actually get to that point, but so far we've gone through all of President Nelson's posts from 2018. And then um, now that we're, we're caught up with that, now we're moving on to Elder Bednar. And so I wanted to do like a little, uh, just kind of like some quick facts about Elder Bednar before we started that playlist. And uh, I came across something really interesting that really, really stuck out. Um, I've always been fascinated by Elder Bednar ever since he was called. Uh, when he was called, he was he was really young compared to the other uh, apostles, the other members of the 12 and the first presidency. He stuck out and he even mentioned that, I think in his first talk, he said, one of these things is not like the others. And uh, you know, I always felt like, wow, like, you know, since he's so young, he's probably going to end up becoming president of the church. You know, there's a good chance because of his age. Um, so <coughs> there's that. There's other things. I'm going to share all the other things. You know, we might as well just go over all the things and do a review because there's always new people joining or subscribing to my channel that haven't heard what I, I've had to say in the past. So it's just constantly reviewing things. Okay, so I was I was going to share some stuff from here in that social media video, but I'm making, you know, a separate video for all this stuff. Elder Bednar's Wikipedia page. Bednar was sustained as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on October 2nd, 2004. At 52 years old, he is the youngest man named to the body since Dallin H. Jokes in 1984. He was ordained an apostle on October 7th, 2004 by church president Gordon B. Hinckley. And that's what stuck out. October 7th, 2004. You know why? It's because October 7th is now a date similar to 9-11, at least when it comes to Israel. Because October 7th, 2023, that's when the war started. A surprise attack by Hamas. Um, it was almost exactly 50 years from the start of the Yom Kippur War, which also started as a surprise attack. Uh, so it was just on, on our calendar, the Gregorian calendar. Uh, I think it's this war started exactly 50 years in one day from the time that the Yom Kippur War started. And, you know, I, I feel and I think many of you feel that this is uh, the last war. You know, it's the beginning of it. Gog and Magog, including the Battle of Armageddon, which is part of Gog and Magog. So um, it's just weird that he was ordained on October 7th, not just because, you know, we have an apostle that was ordained on that day, um, but because of his seeming connection, maybe, to the Jews. And what I mean by that is... Bednar is uh, traditionally a Jewish name. And I don't know why there's, there's always people that like, I'll share like little bits of information and then they'll be like, Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You share so much like, you know, incorrect information, which is very puzzling to me because the format of my channel, if you haven't noticed is I take you directly to where the source of information can be found. The, the, the source 
I take you to the source. That's why um, all of my, my <coughs> sorry, almost all of my channel is screen sharing, where we go directly to the source. Someone was like, no, that's not a Jewish name. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, okay. Yeah, I personally don't know. That's why I rely on authoritative sources. So if we go to Ancestry.com, it has an entry for Bednar's with a Z at the end, which is just a variation of Bednar. And I'm about to show you. So Bednar's family history, Polish and Jewish from Poland. Occupational name for a Cooper, Polish, Bednar's. Okay, so there's that. You go to Family Search. That's the church's website. Okay, Bednar Family History. Uh, Czech, Bednar. Slavic and Russian, uh, Bednar. Uh, which you can see here, Slovenian, occupation, occupational name for a Cooper. So it's just like the Polish, a Cooper. So it's the same thing right here. Americanized form of Polish Bednars, Cooper. Okay, it's a Co Cooper in Jewish. All right, go over here, go to family education, Jewish last names. And uh, guess what? Beznars or Bednars. Polish and Jewish, occupational name for a Cooper, Polish, Bednars. <coughs> and then you have it here too on Wikipedia. Bednar is a Czech surname meaning Cooper. So, oh yeah, this too. Uh, American last names, last name Bednar, origin, Jewish, Jewish, Czech, Slovakian, Croatian, Romanian, Austrian, uh, Hungarian. So, Hopefully, if you're one of the people that claim that this was wrong information, hopefully, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. You'll, you'll have to take it up with Ancestry.com, Family Search, and all these other sites. Bednar is a Jewish name. Now, I don't know if Jews would consider him Jewish because it's not according to the patrilineal line or the father's side. It's according to the mother's side. That's what determines if you're Jewish according to Judaism. Of course, in our church, uh, it doesn't seem like that's how we determine that at all. Like we, Well, for one thing, um, <clears throat> the only thing that we do is whether you're a member of the church in the first place, and that doesn't depend on your ancestry. And then your tribal lineage uh, depends on your patriarchal blessing. And at the moment, it doesn't seem like that has anything to do with your mother's side. It's just simply according to the Lord and in uh, the patriarch and how he declares your lineage based on the spirit. Um, are there rules for that? Uh, there could be, but we, I, as far as I know, that hasn't been revealed. Maybe when everything's revealed, we'll find out, oh yeah, you're uh, Ephraim because it's according to your mother's line. Or it's, well, in Judaism, it's according to the father's line. Like the mother's line determines if you're Jewish, and then the father's side determines what tribe you are. Does it make sense? Father, tribe, mother, Jewish. So maybe we'll find that out in the eternities. I don't know. But <clears throat> it's just interesting that he very well may have Jewish ancestry, despite the Jewish uh, definition of what a Jew is. Does it make sense? Okay, so he was called at a relatively young age. Um, we're going to look at some other ages, though. It's not, when you go back in time, uh, it's not too uncommon, but in more recent times, it kind of is. So a younger age, he has a last name that um, is Jewish. It's a Jewish last name. Okay, and then also, let's see, where do we go from here? Um Let's go to this. Okay, this, so this is a Wikipedia page called List of General Authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I think it's been well known for a while that Elder Bednar uh, was over the, the church area called Middle East slash North Africa. Well, I think that actually changed. And I just found that out as I was researching for this video. I think for a, a long time he was over this area. And According to this note, okay, the Wikipedia footnote, um, you find that out of all places from Elder Patrick Kieran's page. Now, 
<coughs> his page has been updated. It no longer says what it used to say. I have old videos where we came here and it said that, um, well, let me just read it. Okay. So church service, Elder Patrick Kieran served as uh, president of the presidency of the 70 since 2020 and as a member of the presidency of the 70 since 2017, where he helped supervise the Middle East uh, slash Africa North area. Um, now, it used to say, like, he uh, he assisted Elder David A. Bednar. Uh, something to that effect. I'd have to go find the old video and then find the part of the video where uh, I shared the screen. But that's what it used to say. And that's how we knew that Elder Bednar was over that area. I'm not aware of any other place that you can go to verify that. Um, when you go to the Apostles pages, like when you come to their page that looks like this, you know, on the, the, on the church website. So for example, I have this up, okay, David A. Bednar, and it doesn't tell you what area he's over. So the only, the only way that we had any idea of that, um, or at least that I knew of that, uh, was from Elder Kieran's page, uh, before he became an apostle, it mentioned that Elder Bednar was over that area and he assisted him. Okay. Now, uh, it appears now, if you go back to the Wikipedia article, there's another footnote, <coughs> because after it says Middle East, North Africa, uh, there's another area, North America, West, and Europe, Central areas. And then it has footnote 10. And you can see that the date for that footnote is just a few weeks ago, like a month ago, the 14th of December, 2023. So that takes you to uh, Brent H. Nielsen, and that says he currently assists Elder David A. Bednar in supervising the North America West and Europe Central areas, and Elder U U Ulysses Suarez in supervising the Caribbean and Pacific areas. Okay, this is like the only way that I know of that we can, that we know what areas the po the apostles are over. If you have some other source, please send it to me. Please do. I would like to know that. But as you can see, uh, when you go to this list of general authorities, you have you have all the apostles here in uh, this column for area. A lot of it's blank because it's they just don't really publicize it that much. Okay. We don't know about Del, uh, Elder Del G. Renland or Gary E. Stevenson, what areas they may be over or supervise. Okay. So... It would seem to me that Elder Bednar is no longer over the Middle East, but he was, which is interesting because he has that Jewish last name. We don't know what tribe he's from because that's not something that uh, is put out there publicly, right? We, we don't necessarily publicly share our, our tribe. It's supposed to be special, sacred, just like your patriarchal blessing, although there's not a problem like talking about it with some people, but it's not something that you like openly you know, broadcast, you know, I'm, I'm from Ephraim, I'm from Manasseh, I'm from Benjamin, whatever. So I wouldn't be surprised though, if maybe he's from Judah. So anyway, Jewish last name, he was over the Middle East. Um, he was also a part of this thing right here. I've done a video about this. This was a couple, <coughs> excuse me, a couple years ago. Let's see, October 19th, 2021. Uh, there was this, um, well, it's right here, BYU Islam Conference, Elders Bednar and Gong, Muslim Faith. And uh, what happened there is they uh, kind of introduced this new pamphlet called Muslims and Latter-day Saints, Beliefs, Values, and Lifestyles, uh, where it's just a very basic overview comparing the two faiths together, uh, similarities and differences. And it's on the church's uh, there's a part of the church website, it doesn't say it here, but there's a church, there's a part of the church website called Interfaith uh, Relations. I think, I think you find it here. Go to Gospel Library. Uh, man, where is it? Is it under Books and Lessons? There's a, there's a place that's called Interfaith Relations. I, oh, here it is right here. Interfaith Relations. See that? 
has elder, uh, or actually President Holland, and then what looks like a Catholic priest. You click on that. And at the moment, the only thing that there is under interfaith relations is this pamphlet. Um, and then some videos. And it looks like the only video is the one that we were just looking at. So, again, he's over the Middle East and probably at that time, that's probably why he was part of this conference because obviously the Middle East, there's, it's mostly uh, Muslim countries. So him and an elder gong, you know, elder gong is of Asian ancestry. And so the closest thing to the Middle East uh, would be Asia. I don't know if that's why he was selected or I don't know if he's over Asia. In fact, let's go back to this and see if there's anything for elder gong. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, according to this, he's over Asia and Asia North. That's what he oversees or supervises or whatever. Um, <coughs> okay, so so it's just interesting. It's just interesting. Um, again, young Jewish last name in during that time, he you know, involved with all this stuff in the Middle East. And not only that, but the fact that his name is David. That's another thing. So I, there's like this notion out there. And I don't hear it very often, but I've heard it from time to time that there's a two David prophecy and uh, people who I, I don't think understand it fully. They think that it's referring to the two witnesses. Uh, they think that there's a prophecy where the two witnesses, their names are going to be David. And I haven't been able to substantiate that at all. I can't find that anywhere. I think it's based on a misunderstanding. Uh, there is the concept of the two Davids, the first one being King David, who was the father of Solomon, that David, and then Christ being the second David and how <clears throat> he's going to come and reign during the millennium. Uh, so I think people don't fully understand that. I don't know. If you know of some, you know, two David prophecy... <clears throat> please send it to me and I'll look into it. Um, Bruce R. McConkie has a chapter called uh, The Second David Reigneth in the Millennial, <coughs> sorry, the Millennial Messiah. But uh, he explains that it's it's referring to Christ. You know, Christ uh, is of the line of King David. He's the rightful heir according to, um, you know, the worldly um, temporal kingdom of Israel, right? So you have that, but what I have noticed, and I did, I've done a video about this before, but we're going to do this again. I've created a new spreadsheet just for this, what I'm about to talk about. Uh, back when I was first looking into that, if there is a prophecy of the two Davids, uh, it was noted that right now we have two apostles whose first name is David. We have David, I'll zoom in, we have David A. Bednar and D. Todd Christofferson. The D is for David, right? And what's interesting is that, let's go back here. So in the very beginning, we started out with at least one apostle named David, David W. Patton. Now, maybe some of you can help me out. I tried to look this up because Wikipedia was saying that David Whitmer was an apostle, <coughs> But the, the date that they have for that seems to be from before the Melchizedek priesthood was even um, given uh, to the church, right? And apostle is an office within the Melchizedek priesthood, so that doesn't quite make sense. I searched the church website. I couldn't find anywhere that said that David Whitmer was an apostle. Um, we're going to go into the history of the apostles. So I have him here for now, but if some of you could maybe help me understand this, it would be greatly appreciated. So at the very least, we started with one David, okay? And then you have one, two, three, and then all the way up to 69 years that go by. And then in the 70th year, you have David O. McKay that comes on the scene. So that's kind of interesting, 70 years, and then we have another David. And then David O. McKay is with us for a long time, uh, passes away in the year 1970 of all years. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years later, seven, we have another David, David B. Haight. In the year 
1977. <laughs> you, under, you understand this? We start with the David, okay? Four years of this David, or possibly like three years, maybe three and a half. I don't know. 70 years go by. In the 70th year, we have another David. And then after this David passes away, seven years later, we have David B. Haight, who becomes an apostle in 1977. Okay, so he's with us for a while. And then it turns out that when he passes away, it's David A. Bednar that takes his place. So one David takes over for another David. And these are all the Davids. I have this other spreadsheet, and this is the one that took me forever to put together because I had to manually copy and paste dates over here and create all these columns, do all the formulas. So here is a list of all the apostles, okay, all the way from Joseph Smith until Patrick, Elder Patrick Kieran. And those are all the Davids. That, that, this is the timeline of all the Davids uh, that have been apostles in our church. Okay. When you go to Elder Bednar's thing, you can see it here. You might remember that Elder Bednar came in at the same time as Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf. Let's refer to this. Go here. Zoom in. Let's go to 150. Okay. You see right here? Uh, apostle number 100 and 101, which is Elder Uchtdorf and Elder Bednar. <coughs> they came in together, called on the 2nd of October, ordained on the 7th of October. Okay. But uh, it's done in order. And the way that it works out is... Um, I should have pulled up Elder... Okay. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf. I'll pull up his as well. So, uh, Elder Uchtdorf, he, he replaced or filled in the spot left behind by Elder Neil A. Maxwell. Okay. He filled in that spot, Elder Neil A. Maxwell. And Elder Bednar filled in the spot left behind by David B. Haight. So that's how it worked out. It could have easily been reverse had Elder Uchtdorf technically been been called first I, I i don't know the whole story behind that but that's this is who replaces who so we already don't have very many davids uh as apostles in this dispensation but it just so happens that this newest well second to newest david replaces another david it's uh, it's statistically unlikely that that would happen almost as though you know, they're supposed to be Davids now. I, I don't know. Maybe they're supposed to be Davids until the second coming. Maybe that's why that happens. So there's no gap without a David. You might, you might think that that's silly, but it's not. You think about all the things in our church. You know, our church is very pragmatic and practical, but there are, uh, there is symbolism and there are things that we do uh, that may seem arbitrary. For example, and I don't know why this is, but there's, a tradition or a commandment, I don't know, when it comes to the 70, you know, the office of 70, that when somebody that's in the 70 reaches the age of 70, they're let go. That's what happens. I don't know why. I don't know what that's based on. I haven't been able to find it. But it happens. And you might like <clears throat> someone may be like, oh, what does that matter? Who cares? Well, it matters for some reason, doesn't it? Because that's what the church does. And so for all we know, maybe there's something about the Davids that we don't know. And that's why this David replaced the other. And now we have the two. So if there is anything to the, to the two witnesses being named David, then maybe it's going to be these two. I don't think that there is such a thing, but... If you can provide that for me, point me to an authoritative source. Don't just like say it, like send me to the source. Then I will follow up with that. Okay. So uh, let's go to this. Let's look at this uh, <laughs> this uh, spreadsheet that took forever. Um, I noticed a, a few things. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
when it comes to being called on, uh, or to, sorry, being ordained on the 7th of October, again, because that's how this all started, 7th of October, President or Elder Bednar, Jewish last name, being over, over the Middle East, you know, and then the day that he's a, he's ordained was uh, 19 years before this war started. It just, it just got me thinking. So I looked to see if I could find anybody else that was ordained on uh, the 7th of October. And there have been. And what's interesting is that the last ones that were ordained to the apostleship on the 7th of October were Spencer W. Kimball and Ezra Taft Benson. And it just so happens that they were called at the same time. And they both ended up becoming prophets. <laughs> it's It's interesting. Called in together and they became prophets. And right now we're looking at um, we're looking at uh, Russell M. Nelson and Dallin H. Oaks. <coughs> Even though the dates are different here, and I have to go through and just like double check this, but essentially uh, President Nelson and President Oaks came in at the same time. You might remember, we've covered this before. Let's see, LDS, Living, Spencer, W. Kimball, in that order. There's this uh, anecdote here about the calling of President Nelson and uh, Elder or President Oaks in that order. There it is. So um, I'm not going to read the whole story, but essentially Spencer W. Kimball was like bedridden. He he couldn't. He wasn't even like coherent, and so toward the end of his life. Th- there was like this time that an entire year went by where one of the spots in the apostleship was left open because he wasn't well enough to call somebody else. And then another person died. In fact, not only did another apostle die, but he died exactly one year after the other one, like on the anniversary of the death of the previous one. Um, gosh, dang it. Do I, do I have that somewhere where I can just show you? You know, he'll just have to believe me. I'm not going to go that far. You you can look, you can read through this. It, it talks about it in here. Uh, or, actually, I don't know if it gives the dates, but you can look it up. Okay. You can look it up. So anyway, in a brief moment of coherency, uh, Spencer W. Kimball uh, told President Hinckley, like, look, okay, this is who the Lord wants. Uh, call, and it says right here, quote, call Nelson and Oaks to the Quorum of the Twelve in that order. Okay, so they may not have been, again, I don't know where these dates come from because I got this from Wikipedia. Um, I know President Oaks came in a little bit later because he had to wrap some things up because at the time he was uh, a Supreme Court justice for the Utah Supreme Court. Um, But essentially they were called at the same time. And it, it's and it seems like unless the second coming happens first, it seems like President Oaks is probably going to be the next president of the church. So you have just as a reminder, we have Spencer W. Kimball and Ezra Taft Benson being called and ordained at the same time and then going on to become presidents of the church. And then you have President Nelson and President Oaks, which it may happen with that as well, with them as well. And then uh, we have. Elder Uchtdorf and Elder Bednar that, I mean, who knows? But like I said, Elder Bednar's age, he's he's probably going to become president of the church um, if the second coming doesn't happen before then. And uh, even after the second coming, there may still be a president of the church that that still, just like how it is now, operates under the direction of uh, the Lord. So I, I don't know how things are going to be in the millennium. Christ will be here, but he may still have a president of the church. Um, so that's interesting to think about. There are other times that apostle apostles have been called together, uh, such as the case with J. Reuben Clark, Alonzo A. Hinckley, but they never became presidents of the church. Um, but again, interestingly, Spencer W. Kimball, Ezra Taft Benson called together and on October 7th of all days. Uh, let's look for other October 7th. There's this big batch right here. Yeah, these two that were called together. And then 
uh, a couple or uh, uh, <laughs> eight years later, or eight years before, there were these three that were called together. So they were all called on October 7th, but uh, none of them became presidents of the church. And uh, those are the only ones. Now, you'll notice that the way that I have it color coded for columns A and J or I and J is if it's orange, then that means that they were called um, either in September or October. And that, that was likely because it was around the time of general conference. And likewise, for March and April, I have it color coded green so that so that you can easily see anybody that was called outside of that pattern. If I zoom out, you can you can see that that's that's usually how it's been done, except for the early church from like um, uh, 1870 and before. You don't have any September or October's. Um, it was all just kind of scattered, uh, mostly February and April, it seems. Those are like the were the two big months. Um, <coughs> after that, you do start to follow this pattern where apostles are called and ordained around the time of general conference. Uh, with you know here and there, there's there's some that don't fit that pattern. And the most recent one that did not fit that pattern was uh, Elder Patrick Kieran. Uh, the last time anyone else was not called around April or October, it was uh, President Holland. He was, uh, that happened in June of, 19, of 1994. Before him, it was President Oaks. Before him, it was Neil A. Maxwell. And then David B. Haight. And then, you know, so it's happened a few times. It's not very common. Although I am very interested in uh, Elder Kieran as well because he breaks that pattern, which is a pretty well-established pattern. It's not unheard of, but he breaks that pattern. He was uh, called and ordained on the 7th of all days, okay, the, the 7th of December. Uh, just a couple months before he became an apostle, there was a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there was this big storm that hit Europe, where he's from. Well, he's kind of like from a few different places, but let me go to 2023. Let's pull up that storm. I think it happened in November, <clears throat> but there was a storm called Kieran. Yeah, right here. Spelled differently. It's an Irish name, Kieran. But, uh, it was among a few other storms that really hit Europe really hard. Uh, but in this case with Kieran, it was France and the UK mostly. Well, and also I think Italy. Was this Kieran? Yes, it was. So th this area right here was hit by Kieran. And um, the dates for these, yeah, it was in the beginning of November. So like a month, like almost exactly a month before he became an apostle, there was a storm named Kieran that was hitting Europe. I, I find that unlikely. Um, I go into more detail about uh, Elder Kieran. Just search his name on my channel. Uh, you know that you can search channels, right? You go to the channel, there's a little search specifically for that channel. Just type in Patrick Kieran and you can uh, watch that video. I go over more details. It's fascinating. There's like a link between him and President, <coughs> excuse me, and President Holland, and uh, just some other stuff. It's really weird. It's really weird. But uh, and by the way, while we're talking about him, let me just and since I have this up, what's interesting is that uh, he lived in Saudi Arabia. He's he's lived and worked in the UK, Saudi Arabia, and the United States, and because he used to help. Uh, because he used to help uh, Elder Bednar with Middle East slash North Africa or Africa North, maybe he's in charge of that area now. And maybe it's because he used to live in Saudi Arabia, so he'd be uh, well suited for that area of the church. I don't know. But it feels like something is going on with him as well. It's interesting. Um, let's go back to this spreadsheet. Um, <coughs> sorry. 
I think that's that's maybe all I have to say. Oh, okay. No. Okay. So Elder Bednar, look at column E right here. I have the ages um, color coded so you can easily see, you know, uh, what decade of life they were in when they were called to the apostleship. And so Elder Bednar is right here. Okay, he was 52. And if you're in your 50s, I have that color coded blue. Uh, since that time, we've had uh, Elder Anderson and Elder Suarez that were called in their 50s. Uh, before him, we had Jeffrey R. Holland, Richard G. Scott, M. Russell Ballard. Let's see. Yeah, M. Russell Ballard and then President Oaks. So President Oaks was one year younger when he was called. But you do have these others that were in their 50s, uh, just like Elder Bednar. So he doesn't really stand out that much in terms of his age is that it's just that when he was called everybody that was already in the quorum of the 12 in the first presidency uh, were were substantially older and so he kind of stood out uh, for that reason but when we go back in time it's pretty common you have you have a uh, president packer boyd k packer that was 45 when he was called and then even more than that uh, President Monson, who was 36, 36, that, that, that's like insane to me, but it's, it's the Lord. So it's not insane, but 36 years old when he became an apostle, that is crazy. <coughs> uh, as you go back in time, you find um, even more that were called at younger ages. You have this whole block right here which includes Harold B. Lee, Spencer W. Kimball, and Ezra Taft Benson, which were all called in their 40s. Um, here's some more here. Joseph Fielding Smith, 33. David O. McKay, 32. Okay. Uh, George Albert Smith. Uh, and you see this, this column right here, Prophet, right? So you can easily pick them out. 33. And then you start getting into into the twenties uh, before George Albert before George Albert Smith. Hiram M. Smith was twenty nine. Abraham O. Woodruff twenty four. Okay, and then you get to the very very early early church, the very beginning, and everybody uh, was either in their twenties. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Was either in their twenties or their thirties when they were called. Now, like I said, up here, they had the Wikipedia has uh, David Whitmer. In fact, they had him before Joseph Smith, which doesn't make any sense. I think there's something wrong with that entry in Wikipedia. And I'm, I may actually see if I can like change that because I think it's wrong. But I'm not going to until I know for sure in, in once I can source it. But um, the way it seems to me, so I took him out. The way it seems to me is you have Joseph Smith first, of course, in Oliver Cowdery um, in 1830. And that's based on that's based on this scripture, DNC 27. As far as I can tell, this is the earliest mention of anybody being an apostle. DNC section 27. Revelation given to Joseph Smith, the prophet, at Harmony, Pennsylvania, August 1830. And when you go down to verse 8, it says, Which, which John I have sent unto you, my servants, Joseph, uh, Joseph Smith Jr. and Oliver Cowdery. And then later on in verse 12, And also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles and a special witnesses in my name and bear the keys of your ministry and of the same things which I revealed unto them. And then of course has, you know, the picture of them. So it seems like, I, I, I don't know what the date is that they were uh, given the Melchizedek priesthood. I think that's one of those things that they don't have an exact date. There's probably some of you that are more into this. Like my whole life when it's come to like these type of things like names like Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin Harris. I, I've always just kind of been like yawn, 
because I, I was younger and I just I didn't really care. This is kind of boring to me. So I'm starting to get I'm starting to get more into it now. But um, so that that's what I have. Okay, for uh, Joseph Smith, and that that's what's on. If I remember right, that that is what's on the Wikipedia is uh, August of 1830, not August 1st. It's just the way I have the dates formatted, it has to have a day. So it just inserted the one and I'm, I don't care. I'm not going to correct that or try and fix that. But um, so you have those two, it seems at first, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. And then the three witnesses, which include David Whitmer, were supposed to select 12 men for the, the quorum of the 12. And here you have the original 12. You see right here, column G, original 12 from Brigham. This is in alphabetical order. Wait, is it? No, it's a alphabetical and I can't remember how this is ordered. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. From Brigham Young down to Orson Pratt. These are the original 12 of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And then things uh, developed from there. Now, what's interesting, and I'm sure a lot of you already know this. Let me zoom out. I have column L that shows you all the apostles that were excommunicated because things were not just like magical and perfect in the magical in, in at the beginning of the church. There were people that fell away from the church, that fell into sin, whatever, and were excommunicated. And a, a pretty large number of here, let me let me bring this over here for a second so we can more easily see. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of the original 12 uh, were excommunicated. So that's kind of crazy. Then you had a couple more after that. Lyman White, Amasa, Lyman, uh, Albert Carrington in 1870, John W. Taylor, 1884, and I think this is the most recent one. Richard R. Lyman in 1918. But since that time, we haven't had any others that were excommunicated. So things aren't uh, perfect. Like the Lord and his plan, it is perfect, but he allows people to have their agency all the way up and including apostles and prophets. You know, you look at Jonah, you look at examples of people that, uh, you know, you look at David, you look at King David. There's always such a, a fuss made about King David and how great he was. And he was great, but he still had his agency and he lost his exaltation. So nobody's excluded. Everybody that comes to this earth is part of this testing process, this testing process. And you get to choose. You get to choose what you do and what choices you make. So the Lord doesn't rob people of their agency. Um, so... You have that that happened, uh, but you have these ones that return to the church. There's these three in column M. Uh, here's a fourth one. Yeah, so four of them returned. Uh, were you know rebaptized. In fact, I think it was Orson Pratt. I think he actually returned. Not only returned, but he was also reinstated to uh, the apostleship. I'm not sure about the other ones because I just I, I don't care. But there's other apostles that were not members of the quorum of the Twelve. They were apostles, but not in the quorum of the Twelve. And, <coughs> excuse me, that, <coughs> that makes sense with Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. I don't know what the story is with these other ones right here. Um, I do know, kind of, of what was going on here. This is the most recent apostle that was not a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. His name was uh, Alvin R. Dyer. He started out, uh, I can't remember the order of events, but he he was like called for a special purpose. He was called because he was like a historian about uh, of Missouri and the, the, the early saints and when they were in Missouri and the lands of Missouri. And he's the one that... Um, essentially was called to work on this uh, whole idea, this whole thing about, oops, that's St. Louis. He was the one that was called to 
figure this situation out with um, the land that the church own owns in uh, Independence, Missouri. Okay. It was during that time that the Independence Visitor Center was constructed. He went through and he looked at the original. I'll pull it up. Sorry, I wasn't planning on talking about this. Um, Zion City Platt, Joseph Smith. Okay. I want to go to the August one. Yeah, the revised city, Platt. Okay. So he's the one that consulted this original plan for the city of New Jerusalem. And this is one reason why I believe this is still the plan. At some point in the future, I would think probably in the millennium, I think that this is this is actually going to come uh, into fruition and that the original plan will be uh, reinstated. But uh, he went into this whole thing being aware of the 12 temples. And th- this is another thing someone was like, well, we have to remember, they're not 12 temples. Yes, yes, they are. Um, City of Zion Platt. Let me go to the first one because there was a first version and then there was a second version. You can find this on the Joseph Smith papers. Okay. Here's the original version. If you go to page two, it, uh, yeah, if you go to page two, it tells you the names of all the temples, the names of the temples to be built on the painted squares. They're temples. Someone was recently saying, we have to remember they're buildings, not temples. No, they are temples. You guys, I'm, I'm not trying to like, um, I'm not trying to like start anything, but if, if you're going to quote unquote correct somebody, like if you're going to quote unquote correct me in the comments, you need to source your information. I do my best. Sometimes I mess up and that's okay. Sometimes you mess up, but I do my absolute best to show you the authority, the authoritative, the authoritative source of what I'm showing you. And it's not always the same in the con- in the comments. Make sure that you know what you're talking about before you comment. D- don't just go off whatever is floating around in your head. The- these are temples. These are temples. There's 24 of them. That is the plan. And they have names. Uh, and the-, the names essentially line up with the different offices of the priesthood. For example, the sacred apostolical repository for the use of the bishops, the holy evangelical house, which that, that corresponds to patriarch for the high priesthood, uh, the house of the Lord for the elders of Zion. So that, that corresponds to the um, office of elder. And then they have ones for the Aaronic priesthood. The, these uh, go back to page one. So no, sorry, this is the first version. Let's look at the second version. So these ones on this side, on the west side, these 12 are Melchizedek priesthood temples. I know that it's a weird idea. We don't have temples like this right now. They're going to have different functions. Some of them are going to be schools. Some of them, some of them are going to be administrative uh, buildings, but they're temples. So these ones on the west side are for the Melchizedek priesthood. The ones on the east are the Aaronic priesthood. And we don't, as far as I know, we don't have much more detail about the function of every single one of them. Um, I do have a playlist called New Jerusalem where I'm going through this with a fine tooth comb. And I'm still working on that playlist. I I plan on finishing it, but um, there is some more that we know, but I'll, I'll share that in that playlist. Okay. So anyway, Alvin R. Dyer, let's get back to Alvin R. Dyer. He's the last apostle that was not in the Quorum of the Twelve. Um, if I remember right, he was like a standalone, <laughs> excuse me, he was like a standalone apostle for a short while, I think like less than a year. And then he uh, joined the first presidency. And it was during that time that he was doing this work with the, the church lands in Missouri. And part of what he did is he figured out by consulting that plan that we were just looking at, which temple this would be. Okay, if if you need okay, I'll, look, future. Uh, here we go, past and future of Temple Lot in Independence. Let's do it again. 
I feel like I need to like, I feel like I need to keep repeating this because this is amazing. I, I think there's a lot of people that don't realize we have a temple right now in New Jerusalem. It's currently being used as a visitor center, but it's meant to be a temple. Here we go. The property purchased by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1904 remained undeveloped until 1968. After two different attempts over the years of the City of Independence slash Board of Education to purchase the property from the church the cons- and concern about the reality of eminent domain by the City of Independence, that me- that's where the government can forcibly take your land, the church made an announcement in December 1967 for the for the present <coughs> excuse me for the present visitor center. Plans were quickly developed and formally approved in April 1968. A groundbreaking ceremony was held the following August. Interestingly, in the development of those plans in early 1967 by church architect Emil Fetzer and with input directly from Alvin R. Dyer. This is the one that was never part of the Quorum of the Twelve that we're talking about. And approval by President David O. McKay. The awareness of the Joseph Smith-inspired expanded 24 Temple Complex prepared in early 1833 was definitely taken into consideration. On March 10th, 1967, a meeting of Dyer and Fetzer, the architect. So the, the member of the First Presidency never a member of the, the Quorum of the Twelve, Dyer and Fetzer, the architect, was with McKay in his Hotel Utah apartment office. Dyer recorded the, highlight, the highlights of this session in his diary. We reported to the president that our study in this direction was to undertake, if we could, to ascertain which of the temple buildings designated would presumably be located on that part of the temple land that the church owned. This we have arrived at and would be concentrated upon for the erection of a building for the purpose intended, the basic structure of which could be used at a future date as part of the temple complex. Dyer continued, The proposed structure would be two stories high with a floor dimension of 61 feet by 87 feet, which dimensions is the same as revealed to the Prophet Joseph Smith as the size of of the complex buildings. And you can also find that on the Joseph Smith papers. I've done it before. We've talked about it in my playlist called New Jerusalem. So that was an apostle that was called for a very special purpose. And the purpose was probably among other things. I don't know the extent of everything that he did, but one of the things was to plan this temple. New Jerusalem has already started to be built. We have a temple and we have a stake in New Jerusalem, the center place. I'm talking about the center place. The whole church is New Jerusalem. It doesn't matter where you live. The whole world will become Zion. There's the stakes of of Zion, but there is the center place, and this is it. And it is essentially already started. And for that reason, I'm not expecting that all of this has to be destroyed by a nuclear bomb or tornado or something. And then we, you know, what's required is the streets have to be in place before the second coming can take place. I don't think so. I think that this is probably sufficient. And if anything, maybe they could renovate this into a temple. I don't know how extensive the renovations would be. You know, the temples are supposed to look like, (coughs) excuse me, they're supposed to look like the Kirtland Temple. You'd have 24 uh, Kirtland temple like uh, temples in this area. But I don't think all of it has to be constructed before uh, the second coming. I just don't think so. I feel like that would be too obvious to the church. It would take away any element of surprise because you're supposed to be watching for the signs of the times and be aware that it's getting close. Um, but at the same time, we're not supposed to know because you're just supposed to be ready at all times. And then he comes um, as a thief in the night, especially for those that are, that are wicked, that are not watching, but for the saints, we'll roughly know, but it's still supposed to, we're not supposed to know the day or the hour. You're just supposed to be caught on your best behavior, ideally. And so if 
the Kansas City area was destroyed in nuclear warfare. And then we built up the actual city of, of New Jerusalem. I think that'd be a little bit too obvious. But that's just my opinion. It's not really my opinion. Uh, we, we, I have a spreadsheet where I go over all these misconceptions. It's called, uh, it's my spreadsheet called quotes uh, over here, quotes, common misconceptions. Okay. Where I go to actual authoritative sources to dispel all these, uh, these misconceptions. Woo wee. Okay. Didn't expect to talk about all that, but that that's pretty much it. It's really, really interesting stuff to think about and to watch. And I'm excited to see what happens in the near future. I think things are coming to an end. I really do. Okay. Well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later. 